I'm Lydia, and I've lived a life that's straight out of a storybook, minus the fancy trimmings. I was a teacher for most of my years, shaping minds and wiping noses. Life took a sharp turn when I lost my husband, Tom, in a car crash. Our son, Michael, was just seven then, and he became my whole world. When my folks passed, they left me a bit of money. I used it to pay off debts and bought a snug little house in the suburbs. It was just me and Michael against the world, and that was enough for us. Now Michael, he grew up smart and kind, every mother's dream. He got himself through college studying computers and landed a decent job right out of school. What's more, he chose to stick around at home. I never minded, the house felt fuller with him in it. Things took an unexpected turn when Michael met Jessica. She was a sharp one, tall, with a head full of curls and a smile that seemed to know more than it let on. I wanted to like her, I truly did. But something about her just didn't sit right with me. The day he brought her home to meet me, she was all sweet talk and compliments. Mrs. Connor, your home is absolutely lovely, so warm and welcoming, she exclaimed as she toured the living room. Thanks, dear. We like it cozy around here, I replied, trying to make her feel at home despite my reservations. Over dinner, their news dropped like a lead balloon. Mom, we've been thinking about the future a lot lately, and, well, we're getting married. Michael announced, his eyes bright. I nearly choked on my water. Married? That's, that's wonderful. I managed, my voice a bit too high. Jessica beamed, reaching across the table to squeeze my hand. We want to do it soon, just a small thing, you know? Nothing fancy, she added quickly, as if to cushion the blow. I nodded, plastering on a smile. Of course, whatever makes you too happy. But as the wedding plans rolled on, and Jessica's true colors started showing when she thought I wasn't looking, I caught snippets of phone conversations, bits of her saying not-so-nice things about me. I kept my cool, never let on that I knew. I just made a mental note, watch your back, Lydia. This girl's not what she seems. The wedding came and went in a blur of flowers and pastel dresses. I stood by, the proud mother with a smile nailed on, while inside, I was all knots and nerves. Watching them dance, watching her hold him close, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was losing my son to a stranger. After Michael and Jessica's wedding, life got a whole lot more complicated. The young couple decided not to move out, but instead set up shop right under my roof. The house I'd so lovingly curated for decades suddenly seemed to shrink, its walls closing in as Jessica's presence loomed larger and larger. The first few weeks were a buzz of activity, thank you notes to write, wedding gifts to sort through, and endless discussions about their future. But as the dust settled, a new pattern emerged. Jessica, now officially the lady of the house in her mind, took to managing everything, including where I should sit and what I should eat. One evening, while Michael was at work, I found Jessica rearranging the living room. Jessica, what are you doing? I had everything just right. I asked, trying to keep my tone light. Just thought I'd freshen up the place a bit, she snapped, her voice sharp like a kitchen knife. It's good to change things up now and again, don't you think? I didn't agree. Look, I appreciate you trying to help, but please, leave things the way I set them. Michael likes it that way. She scoffed, a sound that grated on my nerves. Well, things change, Lydia. Maybe it's time you start getting used to that. Then came the pregnancy announcement. I should have been overjoyed, and part of me was, but the news also brought new tensions. Jessica, now more than ever, made herself the center of everything. Lydia, I'm really not feeling up to cooking tonight, could you handle dinner? She'd ask, almost daily, as she lounged on the couch, flipping through magazines. I'd nod and head to the kitchen, biting back my frustration. One afternoon, I tried to broach the subject. Jessica, dear, I know you're tired with the baby coming and all, but maybe you could help with the salads or setting the table? She looked at me as if I'd suggested she climb Mount Everest. Really, Lydia? I'm carrying a child here. You expect me to stand and chop vegetables? Before I could respond, Michael walked in, home early from work. 
Jessica turned to him immediately, her tone shifting. Baby, tell your mom I'm not supposed to strain myself. Doctor's orders, remember? Michael, ever the peacemaker, tried to smooth things over. Mom, Jess really needs to take it easy. Maybe we can all pitch in a bit more, huh? As the weeks turned into months, my whole life revolved around Jessica's needs and whims. I felt more like a housekeeper than a family member. One particularly tough day, after scrubbing the kitchen clean while Jessica ordered takeout, I finally let off some steam to Susan, my next-door neighbor and longtime confidant. Lydia, why do you put up with that girl? Susan asked as we sipped coffee in her kitchen. I shrugged, a heavy sigh escaping my lips. What choice do I have? It's Michael's wife. I can't just kick them out. Susan shook her head, her eyes fierce. You need to stand up for yourself, Lydia. This is your house, your rules. Don't let that little tyrant push you around. Her words struck a chord, and as I walked back home, I realized she was right. I needed to reclaim my space, my authority. I was the one who built this life, not Jessica. But figuring out how to do that without losing my son was a puzzle I wasn't sure how to solve. Life in our house grew more complicated with the arrival of Michael and Jessica's twins. At first, the joy of being a grandmother was overwhelming, in a good way. Those tiny hands, the late-night coos, and even the cries were music to my ears. But as the twins grew, so did the demands on my time and energy. Days blurred into nights as I juggled childcare with my job and household chores. Jessica, meanwhile, seemed to take her role as the mother a bit too leisurely, preferring to spend her days lounging or shopping. Cooking was a foreign concept to her, and I found myself handling every meal, on top of cleaning up after everyone. One exhausting evening, I was knee-deep in laundry when Michael came home. Spotting him in the hallway, I couldn't hold back any longer. Michael, we need to talk, I started, the fatigue evident in my voice. He looked concerned, but wary. What's wrong, mom? It's just, it's all too much. I love those babies, but I'm not as young as I used to be. I thought Jessica would take on more by now. Before Michael could reply, Jessica entered the room, her arms laden with shopping bags. What's all this about, Lydia? Why are you upsetting Michael? I took a deep breath, trying to keep my composure. Jessica, I just think it's time you started helping out more around here. Maybe even cook a meal once in a while. Jessica's face twisted into a scowl. Are you saying I'm a bad mother? How dare you? The room grew tense, the air thick with unspoken grievances. I think it might be better if you find your own place. I finally said, the words heavy on my tongue but necessary. Jessica took my words like a slap. So you want to kick us out? Your own grandkids? No, Jessica, that's not what I meant. I just think it might be easier on all of us if you had your space, and I had mine. The conversation ended with no resolution, just a lot of hurt feelings. Jessica stormed off to their room, and Michael followed after a moment, leaving me alone in the silent aftermath. Feeling isolated in my own home, I confided in Susan the next day, over a cup of tea. I just don't know what to do anymore. I'm at my wit's end. I confessed, the steam from the tea fogging up my glasses. Susan was always full of fiery advice. Lydia, you've got to put your foot down. It's your house, your rules. Maybe it's time they learn that. Her suggestion of eviction seemed extreme, but as I mulled it over, it didn't seem entirely unreasonable. I just don't want to lose my son, or my grandkids, I admitted, the fear of making a permanent rift a constant shadow. Sometimes, tough love is the only way, Susan said firmly. But whatever you decide, I'm here for you. Years had flown by, each more draining than the last. I'd hoped things might change as the twins got older, but Jessica never took up the reins as a mother should. She didn't work claiming the kids needed her at home, though it seemed they needed anyone but her given how little she actually did around the house. On the morning of my 58th birthday, I woke early, stirred by a mix of anticipation and loneliness. I baked a cake, chocolate, everyone's favorite. 
I decorated it with the simple tools I had, thinking of the small pleasures that used to light up Michael's face when he was a boy. By the time the afternoon rolled in, the cake sat on the counter, its sweet aroma filling the kitchen. I waited, listening for the sounds of the car pulling up, the kids' laughter spilling in as they returned from kindergarten. But the door that eventually opened brought in no joyful noise, just Michael and Jessica, their faces strangely tense. Where are the kids? I asked, a frown knitting my brow. Michael looked away, and Jessica, ever so blunt, answered. They're at my mom's. We thought we'd take the weekend off. Just the two of us. Jessica poured herself and Michael a glass of wine, without acknowledging my offer. They clinked glasses right there in the kitchen, a silent toast to their getaway. Then, Jessica turned to me, her voice cold as ice. Lydia, would you mind keeping it down this weekend? We really need some quiet. Stunned, I stood there, holding the cake knife, feeling like a stranger in my own home. This is my house, I said, the words heavier than I intended. And it's my birthday. Jessica scoffed, her voice sharp. Look, Lydia, just stay in your room and keep out of our way. We want to enjoy our weekend. Michael didn't meet my eyes. Mom, please, just this once. The pain of his betrayal was sharper than any knife I'd ever held. Your once is every time, Michael. I whispered, my voice cracking. They didn't listen. Instead, Jessica walked up to me, took my arm, and led me to the door. You know, we're already tired of you whining. You should take a walk, clear your head, she said, as she pushed me out into the cold, rainy evening. Dressed only in my house clothes, with nowhere to go, I walked the streets, my tears mingling with the rain. Finally, I found myself on Susan's porch, shivering and miserable. She opened the door, her expression turning from surprise to anger as she saw my state. Lydia, what on earth? Come in, you're soaking wet. As I sat in her warm kitchen, wrapped in a dry blanket, I poured out the whole sorry tale. Susan's face grew darker with each word. This is the last straw, Lydia, she said firmly. You can't let them treat you like this. It's your house, your life, you've got to fight back. Her conviction was a lifeline thrown into the turbulent waters of my despair. But how, Susan? He's my son. I don't want to lose him. You've already lost him if he can treat you this way. Let's call my brother, the lawyer. We'll see what your options are. I nodded, feeling the first stir of resolve. Susan made the call, and her brother agreed to meet me the next day. Sitting in her cozy living room, I realized I was afraid to go back to my own home. A place where I was unwelcome, on my own birthday no less. I trudged back home late that night, heart heavy, and clothes still damp. The house was silent, the only sign of life being the clutter of dirty dishes and half-empty wine glasses scattered around the living room. I didn't bother cleaning up, I was too spent, both emotionally and physically. Instead, I went straight to my room, locking the door behind me. As dawn broke, I lay in bed, the events of the previous day replaying in my mind. I quietly got up, gathered my essentials, phone, house documents, and a bit of courage tucked into my purse, and slipped out to meet Susan's brother, the lawyer. The morning was crisp, and as I walked to the lawyer's office, the cool air felt like a bomb. Susan's brother greeted me warmly, his office a stark contrast to the chaos of my home. Lydia, let's sit down and talk this through, he said, gesturing to a chair across from his desk. I took a deep breath and as I told him everything, his expression grew serious. It sounds like you've been through quite an ordeal. You have rights, especially in your own home. What can I do? I don't want to live like this anymore. I confessed, feeling a mix of hope and fear. Well, we could start by looking into Jessica's past. There might be something there. And, if you're serious about this, we can file for an eviction notice. It's your house, after all he advised, his tone professional yet empathetic. The thought of evicting my own son and his family was heart-wrenching, but the lawyer's words rang true. It was indeed my house, and I deserved peace. I'll do it. It's time I stood up for myself, 
I declared, the decision firming up with every word spoken aloud. The lawyer nodded, drafting the documents as we spoke. He moved quickly, and before long, he had filed a petition in court to evict Michael and Jessica. The court process was brisk, and to my relief and simultaneous heartbreak, the judge sided with me. My claim was justified, I was granted the eviction. The day they moved out was one of the most painful days of my life. Jessica was livid, hurling curses and threats as she packed. You'll regret this, Lydia, you've not seen the last of me, she spat, her eyes wild with fury. Michael, my own son, wouldn't even look at me. His parting words cut deeper than any knife. You've crossed all boundaries, Mom. I never thought you'd actually go through with this. The weeks after Michael and Jessica moved out were quiet. The kind of quiet that lets you think too much, wonder too much. But then, one ordinary Tuesday, a phone call shattered that silence and sent ripples through the rest of my life. The caller was the private detective I had hired at my lawyer's suggestion. I remember fumbling with the phone, my hands shaking slightly as I answered. Mrs. Connor, I found something you need to see, the detective's voice was grave, urgent. What is it? What did you find? I asked, my heart pounding. I think you better sit down for this, he replied. I perched on the edge of my armchair, clutching the phone tighter. I'm listening. The investigation into Jessica's past turned up more than we bargained for. She was not only a known fraud but is also suspected in the death of her first husband. The police couldn't prove anything at the time and she walked free. My breath caught in my throat. And? There's more. She had a child with her first husband, a boy. She abandoned him right after her husband's death. And regarding her husband's fatal car accident, we found new evidence. It appears she might have been directly involved. I felt a chill run down my spine. What kind of involvement? She tampered with his car. We tracked down the mechanic who worked on the brakes. He's been carrying this guilt for years and now, he's ready to confess. He claims Jessica paid him to tamper with the brakes. I sat stunned, unable to speak for a long moment. This, this is monstrous. My son and grandchildren. I need to go to the police. They need to know all this. That's the right step, Mrs. Connor. I'll send over all the evidence we've collected. Hanging up, I felt a storm brewing inside me. With the dossier of evidence in hand, I went straight to the police station. The officers were initially skeptical, but as they sifted through the documents and listened to my account, their skepticism turned to concern. We'll need to take immediate action based on this new evidence, one of the detectives said, his expression grim. Days later, I watched, heart in mouth, as the police arrested Jessica. The scene played out on the evening news, cameras flashing as she was led away in handcuffs. Her face was a mask of fury and disbelief. Back home, Susan sat beside me, her hand gripping mine. You did the right thing, Lydia. It had to be done. On the screen, reporters buzzed around the police, speculating, questioning. I felt a mix of relief and sorrow, relief that the truth was out, sorrow for what it meant for my son. Michael, poor Michael. He had been duped, dragged into a nightmare, by a woman he loved. How could she have hidden all this? How could I not have seen? I murmured, more to myself than to Susan. Sometimes, we see only what we want to. Susan replied softly. But you've possibly saved more lives, Lydia. Remember that. After Jessica's arrest, Michael took on the full responsibility of caring for the twins. He was drowning in legal fees, desperate to prove Jessica's innocence. It wasn't long before he came knocking on my door, the son I'd raised alone, now a weary, desperate man. He looked exhausted, eyes hollow, when he asked, Mom, I need to borrow some money for Jessica's bail. The lawyers are bleeding me dry, but I can't let her rot in jail. My heart ached, seeing him like this, but the sting of his recent harshness was still fresh. Michael, I can't. After everything that's come out. I just can't support that. His face hardened, the hurt in his eyes, turning to anger. 
You never liked her. Now you see your chance and you just let her suffer, huh? What kind of mother are you? Michael, you don't understand. I'm doing this to protect you, to protect the kids, I pleaded, my voice trembling with emotion. Protect us? By tearing us apart? He scoffed bitterly, shaking his head. You've ruined everything, mom. You think you're helping, but you're just making it all worse. With that, he stormed off, curses muttered under his breath echoing around the silent house. The situation took a darker turn when one of Jessica's old friends turned up at the police station, her face pale, her hands trembling. The detectives called me in when she started talking. I never thought she'd actually do it, but Jessica planned it all, the woman confessed, her voice a haunted whisper. She wanted to get rid of you, Lydia. She talked about making it look like an accident, pushing you down the stairs when you were alone. My blood ran cold. The room spun slightly as her words sunk in. She, she wanted to kill me? Yes, and not just you. After you were gone, she planned to do the same to Michael. She wanted everything, the house, the money, everything you both owned. The detectives ensured me they were taking it seriously, but the revelation shook me to my core. As I left the station, the world seemed a different place, darker, more dangerous. Back home, Susan was waiting, her expression grim. I heard what happened. That woman is a monster, Lydia. You know that now, right? I do, but Michael doesn't. He still thinks I'm the enemy. I sighed, the weight of my son's estrangement heavy on my heart. Give him time. He's got to see the truth for himself. And he will. He has to, Susan said firmly, squeezing my hand in solidarity. As I lay in bed that night, the silence of the house was no longer comforting, but a reminder of the family I once had. The betrayal, the danger I had unknowingly lived with. I shuddered at the thought of what might have happened if I hadn't acted, if I had let my doubts and Michael's displeasure sway my resolve. When Michael finally saw the horrific truth, he halted all legal support and refused to post bail for her. He filed for divorce and moved to strip Jessica of her parental rights. One rainy afternoon, not long after these events, Michael came to my door. His eyes were weary, his shoulders slumped, an image of defeat and remorse. Mom, can I come in? His voice was low, hesitant. I nodded, stepping aside to let him into the house. It felt strange having him there, in the space that had been a battleground for so long. Mom, I, I'm here to apologize. For everything. I was blinded, and I didn't listen to you. I'm so, so sorry. I listened, the words I had longed to hear now stirring a tumult of emotions within me. Michael, you believed in her, protected her, even when she was destroying our family. How do you think that felt for me? I know, I know it was wrong. I can't even begin to understand how much I hurt you. He replied, his voice cracking with the burden of his guilt. And the children? I pressed, needing to know they were safe. They're with me now. They're safe, I promise. Jessica, she won't be able to hurt them anymore. He assured me, determination stealing his features. I nodded, the information settling some of my fears. And what do you want from me, Michael? He swallowed hard, looking down at his hands before meeting my gaze again. I want. I hope that we can start to rebuild. I miss you, Mom. And the kids miss their grandma. I took a moment, the decision heavy on my heart. I want to see the grandchildren. They shouldn't suffer because of all this. But you, Michael. I'm not sure I can forgive you. In the days that followed, I spent more time with my grandchildren, cherishing their laughter and the joy they brought to the quiet house. Their innocence was a balm to my worn soul, and I was determined to raise them differently, to instill values that perhaps I had failed to fully instill in Michael. Susan, ever my rock, stood by me through it all. You're doing the right thing, Lydia, she would say during our long talks over coffee. You're strong, and now you're free to live your life on your terms. She was right. I had learned a hard lesson about the dangers of losing oneself in the care of others, of ignoring one's own needs and rights. 
Now, I was rediscovering who I was beyond being a mother and a grandmother. Reflecting on everything that had happened, I was grateful. Grateful for the truth, no matter how painful it had been, and for the chance to start anew. Life was different now, richer and more mine than it had been in years. I was moving forward, one sure step at a time, on a path that was entirely my own.